Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar, Building a Science of Reading Ecosystem, Demystifying MTSS and the Science of Reading. My name is Victoria, and I'm a marketing manager here at Amplify. Today's webinar will be recorded, and we'll be emailing out that recording link for you to rewatch as you'd like, and everyone here with us today will also receive a certificate of attendance. We have captioning enabled for you, so if you want to access those captions, please click on live transcript in the bottom tray. Throughout the webinar, if you have any questions, please pop those in the Q&A box and we'll try to get to them at the end. We also welcome comments in the chat. And to start, please let me know where you're joining us from today and also let us know what your favorite thing about the science of reading is. And if you want, you can also let us know what you are most curious about when it comes to MTSS. And while you do that, I'm just going to go over a couple of other housekeeping items. Um, we have some more webinars scheduled for this series. So if you haven't already signed up for more, please do. Next week, we are jumping into biliteracy, and we're going to explore how to bring research-based instruction to literacy instru biliteracy instruction. To find out about those other webinars in this series and to watch recordings of past ones, please visit amplify.com backslash SOR dash everyone dash fall 2022. Thanks again for joining us today. We are so excited to have Susan Lambert join us as she kicks off this webinar series. You probably know her as the host of our chart topping Science of Reading the podcast, which is celebrating 2.7 million downloads, but she is also our chief academic officer of elementary humanities and is an expert of all things science of reading. Hi, Susan. How are you doing today? I'm doing great, Victoria. Thanks for that introduction and for the reminder at the end, for those of you that didn't quite get all those webinars, we have a slide at the end that will share the next ones that are coming up. So um, Victoria and I've got a couple other folks behind the scenes. So they're gonna watch that chat box and that Q&A box. Um, I am coming to you from Minneapolis, Minnesota this afternoon, which is not a normal place for me to be. Um, I usually live in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Well, I do live in Grand Rapids, Michigan, Michigan, not usually, um, but I usually do the webinars from there, but I'm here in Minneapolis. So if you are from Minneapolis or from Minnesota, put that in the chat box. Before we started the webinar, we were talking about uh, all the connections to Minnesota. Um, so Minnesota is a great place to be. Well, thank you again for joining us. Um, we're going to talk today a little bit about building this ecosystem and demystifying the science of reading in MTSS. Um, this is actually a repeat webinar, although I probably won't say the same things as I did in the first webinar because I tend to say different things. Um, but we did run this webinar um, early in the fall. Um, and we thought it would be great to just revisit it because there's been a series of, of webinars all about some elements of MTSS, um, and we just thought it would be a great reminder. Um, we're going to talk at a pretty high level. So um, again, like Victoria said, if you're really interested in diving in a little more deeply, go back and see what those other webinars are that we already held. Um, and so you can dive into that detail. So here we go. Thanks again, Victoria. All right, so what are today's goals? Today's goals is we're going to look at some common myths and misconceptions, and we're going to do that both as it relates to the science of reading and, and MTSS. Um, we're gonna look at how these two ideas are really complementary, how science of reading um, really intersects with MTSS, providing really the framework then for evidence-based instruction. We're going to unpack or review some principles of the science of reading. I think this is really important. We do it on almost every single science of reading webinar. Oof, that was hard to say. Um, but I think it's good for us to just always go back and remind ourselves of those key important elements. Um, and then we're going to provide a high level outline of the elements of MTSS. Um, and then how, how we can get all of these sort of working together in concert so we have this really nice supportive ecosystem um, of literacy, instruction, and intervention for all students. All right, let's start with some correcting of misconceptions. So I run into these misconceptions all the time, um, and we're going to keep putting this forward over and over again because we want people to remember that the science of reading is not just an educational fad. So that's a myth that's out there, that this science of reading stuff is going to end up going away. 
Um, but really, um, it's not. We'll talk about that in a minute. People think that the science of reading advocates think it's a one size fits all approach. So the same kind of instruction for all students. You know, there are multiple ways to teach reading. There's only one way, though, that actually um, uh, builds the right neural networks in our brain. But that doesn't mean it needs to be delivered to in the same way to all students. We know some students need more time and instruction. So that's a misconception. Another misconception that I really worry about is that folks think it's just about teaching phonics, and that's not true. We're going to look at the simple view of reading framework, and even back when that framework was developed, we knew that it's not just about decoding. Language comprehension and understanding the words on the page is so critical um, to development as competent readers. Science of reading implementation isn't just a curriculum or a program either. Curriculum and programs can help support evidence-based practices, but the science of reading is really a body of research evidence that tells us how our brain learns to develop to read, um, as well as ways that we can instruct on that. So don't think you can buy a program and you have a science of reading approach. And another common misconception at that science of reading instruction, oh, that's just really boring. It's that kill and drill stuff that you know demotivates kids. And that's not true. If that's what you think science of reading instruction should look like in your classrooms, that's not right at all. Um, and we should see science of reading instruction that really energizes and motivates students um, and helps them become confident and capable readers and, and readers that they're, they're proud to become. The Reading League, shout out to the Reading League. I was just in Indiana at a Reading League Indiana event. I love the, the work that they're doing across the country. Um, if you don't know the Reading League, Google the Reading League. This defining guide comes is right on their website. It comes from the Reading League and they have chapters all over the country. So if you are in one of those states that has a Reading League chapter, I really encourage you to get involved and take advantage of the professional development that they offer. What the Reading League did in this defining guide was really help us understand a, a robust definition for what is the science of reading. And, and I just wanna highlight some of these orange words, which the orange, orange words were my addition here. Um, it's a vast interdisciplinary body of scientifically based research. So we're talking about evidence from the fields of education, from the fields of psychology, from the fields of neuro, uh, neuroscience, um, from the fields of linguistics. So all kind of scientific based research that helps us understand not just reading, but writing as well. I should have put that in my common myths, the common myths that it's just about reading. It's really the science of literacy. It's all about what it takes to become a literate reader uh, and writer. And again, the research has been conducted five decades uh, across the world. So 50 years worth plus of research, thousands and thousands of studies. And what these studies are actually showing is accumulating evidence. I love the word preponderance, right? Evidence to help us understand how proficient reading and writing develops and why some have difficulty. But the ultimate goal of all of this is prevention of and intervention for reading difficulties. So what we want to do is we want to, as soon as kids come to us uh, in the schooling years, we want to make sure that we're delivering to them the kind of instruction that will keep them from needing further intervention. And that means giving them specific instruction in the areas they need that instruction as they move from early readers to very skilled readers and writers. So again, check out this defining guide. You can download this document. Um, it gives you all kind of great information, but I really, really love this definition uh, that they use. All right, let's jump to MTSS quickly, and we're going to unpack these, remember, but let's, let's talk about some misconceptions. So um, one common misconception is that it focuses on individual student needs who need intervention support. And we're going to find out that this is partly a focus on individual student needs who need support, but it's a systems approach to ensuring that all students are on track to get what they need to have. MTSS misconception, 
All it is is a by a specific program or a curriculum or an assessment, and that's not true either. So MTS is a real uh, uh, system effort, and there's some things that we have to put in place and some behaviors we need to engage in. Some people think that it's just a process for identifying students who may need special education services, and that's not true either, right? It's a process whereby we're looking at data and we're looking at how our system is supporting students to develop in terms of reading proficiency, um, and we'll unpack that just a little bit. Some folks think it's separate from special education, and it should not be, right? This should all be in the spirit of serving all of the students um, and, and understanding what each individual student needs in terms of that. And some folks thinks it's just a series of procedures, which it's not that either, either, right? One thing that we know is teaching kids how to read is not an easy proposition. We also know that some kids need more than other kids. And so we wanna make sure that we employ a systematic approach to that, which MTSS, MTSS helps us do. Um, and so, like I said, we're gonna dig into what that means and how it relates to the science of reading. Okay. Definition. So this definition comes from the Center on Multi-Tiered Systems of Supports. Um, you can see that I've included that website down here. If you have not visited that site, it's a great per first place to start um, and a place to dig in a little bit if you're still trying to get your arms wrapped around it. What I love about this definition is it starts with a proactive and pre preventative framework. I'm going to go back. Let's see if I can go back a couple slides, we ended our science of reading definition with, we're trying to improve student outcomes through prevention and of an intervention for reading difficulties. So where we ended with that science of reading definition is where we're picking up with this MTSS definition. And this multi-tiered systems of supports, that's what MTS stands for, is proactive and preventative framework. And what it does is it uses data and instruction to really look at student achievement and supporting in a system way. So look again at some of these orange words. It's data-based decision-making related to program improvement. So we're going to look at that and unpack that. And it's comprised of four essential elements. Screening, use of universal screening. You can see this on their image here. Progress monitoring. Multi-level prevention system all within some data-based decision-making. And so MTSS is really the structure whereby we're monitoring students, screening them for risk, monitoring students, putting them into multi-level prevention systems whereby that we can meet each of their needs. So this is going to be the RTI we're going to unpack, all while we're looking at decision-making based on some data. And so science of reading instruction fits nicely into that process as we start to think about how we're going to ensure all students learn how to read. Okay, let's go back to our science of reading frameworks. What in the world do we mean by that? And if you've been with me in other webinars or presentations before, you're probably getting sick of this slide, but I think it's really important to revisit and keep this framework in mind. So the simple view of reading tells us that skilled reading is really a product of both language comprehension and word recognition. And we know how multiplication product, uh, uh, multiplication, what am I trying to say? Um, equations, there's the word, whew. We know how multiple multiplication equations work. And that is anytime you have a zero on one in one of these factors, you're going to get a zero as the outcome. So if you are just recognizing words with no language comprehension, there's no skilled reading there. Likewise, if you know all the vocabulary and you understand the language that's being read to you, but you can't recognize the words on the page, you're not a skilled reader either. And so anytime you hear folks talking about, oh, all the, all the science of reading people are advocating for is word recognition or decoding, that's not true because even the authors of this framework say no reasonable proponent of decoding has ever equated the two. What we do know 
is word recognition is a predictor of later reading comprehension, highly correlated predictor. And so it's important, but it's not important on its own. We also use Scarborough's reading rope to really help us understand and unpack this simple view of reading and what's involved. So if you think about the word simple and you think about the word easy, they're not the same thing, right? Simple, we know how to, let's put this in another context, we know how to lose weight. So instead of skilled reading, let's put weight loss in there. And weight loss is really reducing your, your intake of calories and your exercise, right? You can't have one without the other to lose weight. That seems like a pretty simple equation. Um, the reality is, is it's not that easy to actually do, right? So a little bit like that. So think of that idea a little bit as we look and unpack Scarborough's reading rope. The idea here is language comprehension on the top, word recognition down here, and skilled reading is represented all the way over here on the other side of Scarborough's reading rope. And you'll notice the interweaving of these skills um, very tightly by the time we get to skilled reading, which means that kids are very automatic in word recognition, and that helps them then put all of their cognitive energy into reading text and writing text uh, using a strategic approach. So we know that Science of reading involves knowledge and vocabulary and how sentences are put together, making connections in those sentences and between sentences, coming out of that text with the gist or the main message, um, as well as being able to recognize sounds, letters that they represent, and then how they build words. And so we need both language comprehension and word recognition, and our instruction in the classroom needs to pay attention to both. Although you'll see as kids develop, the focus needs to somewhat change over time in terms of what's the most impactful in reading instruction. I, I like to say that because if you are in a K-5 building right now and you have um, a, essentially an ELA block and the ELA block in every single grade level looks the same this amount of time on word skills, this amount of time on writing, this amount of time on something else, spelling. Um, if it's the same from K to five, you're probably not paying attention to what kids need at individual grade levels because those blocks of time should be used a little bit differently um, as kids learn to read um, and grow over time. So just another way to say this, um, Claude Goldenberg reminds us that full-fledged literacy requires more, but there's a reason the group of skills is called foundational. We have to get those strong in place, and that solid foundation is really, really uh, important for later than reading comprehension. Um, and so that instruction is important, but it's not the only thing. Okay. So we went through and walked through a little bit of the science of reading. We did that kind of quickly, um, but we want to dig in a little bit more to MTSS and how does the science of reading fit in with MTSS? Well, I'm gonna start with a definition of systems because we said earlier that MTSS is really a systems approach. Um, and in a systems approach, we need a couple of things. So you can see, you know, great thing to do is when you want to get the definition of a word, you can Google it and Google gives you really good definitions. So first of all, we see from this definition that a system is a set of things working together as parts of a mechanism or an interconnecting network. So when we think about talking about our assessment system, our curriculum that we're delivering, um, our intervention programs, we want to think about them all working together as a system. And we're going to come back and talk about this um, in, in a few slides, but think about an assessment you may have that doesn't give you instruction um, information about what kids need next in instruction. And so when you have misalignment with those things, it really doesn't help you get to the appropriate outcome goal. And then the second definition of system is a set of principles or procedures according to which something is done, an organized framework or a method. Again, I love how they use the example here of the public school system. Again, this is a common set of principles or ideas. 
supported by a common set of things that are working together all to get us to the outcome that they, we want to have. And so you can think of MTSS as that system that all the things we're putting in that system work together to accomplish the goal. And all of the people that are working within that system understand how those things work together um, to get us to proficient reading in this case. So we're gonna keep that little image. Remember the image of, of MTSS that we pulled from the website. We'll keep that up for just a minute. And let's look at what does this look like in the system? So if we're using a multi-tiered system of support, that means that everything at all levels of the system is in alignment so that we can determine how well that system is supporting the very important thing calls the kids in the classroom. So whatever is happening in the classroom needs to be understood at the school level and needs to be understood at the district level. Likewise, all the district supports and systems um, that they're providing or expecting at the school level at the classroom level all have to be in concert designed to support students um, as they learn how to read in this example. So how do we do that? So first of all, every level of the system has to focus on student outcomes. So asking some of these questions like proficiency. Are at least 80% of our students not at risk? What about progress of those kids? Are at least 95% of those students not at risk or are they staying out, out of risk? Every level of the system has to respond by identifying and understanding the problem if these things aren't true, planning, implementing, and then monitoring those solutions to ensure that these things are true. And so every time we collect a piece of data from students in this system, every time we deliver a piece of instruction in this system, we need to make sure that we're looking at the student response um, and where we need to prioritize resources. So remember I told you that image we were gonna look at to pull these systems together. We use the word alignment in education way too often, um, but in this case, I really want to unpack it a little because it's really important. Um, because often we have a core instructional program or we've piecemealed pieces and pulled together um, elements of a core instructional program that sometimes are misaligned. They don't always support right the goal of getting kids language comprehension, word recognition to get to that reading proficiency. Um, so we wanna make sure those things are in alignment within our system. Sometimes too, when kids need extra time in instruction, whether that's differentiated instruction and personal practice in the classroom or additional intervention time outside the core block, Sometimes we also bring in practices or programs that are not exactly aligned to the core instruction, which should be aligned then to those science of reading based principles. And so if we're doing something a little bit out of alignment with that, it's not going to help our students get to where we need to go. And then lastly, we want to make sure that the data we collect in terms of universal screening and progress monitoring is the kind of data that supports us in understanding how well the students are progressing, both in word recognition, language comprehension, and skilled reading. And if that data doesn't support then us understanding what to do next, we may need to look at using a different type of assessment. So when we're thinking about implementing a multi-tiered system of support to ensure our students are progressing in language comprehension and word recognition to develop as skilled readers, we want to look at all of the elements or all of the instructional tools and assessment tools we're using in our schools to ensure we're getting the right kind of information and supporting students in that instruction. So let's talk through some of these key components then. Um, and again, this 
information is available on that website that I shared with you in terms of MTSS. Um, and it's really interesting to, to sort of do an inventory or audit, whether it's at your classroom level, your grade level, the school level, the district level, to sort of think about your approach in these four key components. Are they aligned with each other? Do you have gaps? Um, and, and so let's sort of talk through them. So first of all, we have universal screening and progress monitoring. We know that's really important. When kids come into us at the beginning of the year, we need to make sure we administer a strong universal screening assessment to all students. And what we're looking for there is to identify risk. Um, I'm gonna show you an example of that in a later slide, but this is really important at the district level to understand where are the schools that may need more resources to support at-risk populations that are higher. This is important at the school level to understand what grade levels or classrooms may need additional resources to, put, to support where there's high levels of risk. Um, and this is important at the classroom level to really understand what students you have in your classrooms uh, that are more at risk. And so that universal screening measure is really important, not only to administer, but then to also look at the data and understand what the data are telling. We also have progress monitoring tools, and essentially those are for those students that are at risk to make sure we're monitoring them between benchmark periods, between beginning, middle, and end, um, to see how they're making progress and if we need to make adjustments. So you can hear already how we're employing a problem solving process and we can employ that problem solving process at all levels of the system at the, at the district level to use our data to identify, analyze some of these problems, plan interventions, and then monitor and evaluate those plans. And we would do this at every single level of the system. Most importantly, the closer we are to the students. So once you've identified areas where students are at risk, you have to dig in a little bit to understand what about that area puts them at risk. We need to plan some interventions to deliver the instruction then that they need to have, um, and then monitor and evaluate those plans to make sure those plans um, are being implemented with fidelity. Um, and and you know, that's really important in terms of watching student outcomes. So you also heard me talk a little bit about all levels of student support, and that's really our tiered systems of support. And we're gonna look at that in, in the next slide, but we have to make sure that every student is getting core instruction. So that block of ELA instruction that you have in your classroom, no matter where students are in their proficiency level, we want to make sure they have access to that core instruction. Some students are going to need additional instruction outside of that core block, and some students are going to need a lot of additional instruction. But remember, that's additional instruction and not replacement instruction. All of this should be implemented in a real collaborative team-based approach, right? So we aren't doing any of this in isolation. We're going to come together. We're going to solve problems together. Um, in, in a real collaborative environment. So most of us are familiar with this RTI triangle, our tiered systems of supports. The idea that what we're going to do is identify and support struggling students. And I wanna unpack this just a little bit and look at this. Um, First of all, you can see that there is this triangle of assessment that runs all the way around this RTI triangle. I think that's really important because again, we don't just deliver assessment for assessment purposes. Those assessments should really help us both identify and monitor students that are at risk in a couple of different ways. Um, we will unpack that in the universal screening, but we want to know that really about 80% of our students should be in core instruction. Remember that core instruction should be a good, high quality instructional program that pays attention to both language comprehension and word recognition um, at the points of time kids need specific uh, things in their development. That core instruction, 80% of your kids should be in 
be able to engage in that with no further support. You might have to do some differentiation um, on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, sometimes if kids don't quite get it, you have to reteach a lesson. But for the most part, the majority of the students in your classrooms should be able to engage in that grade level or core instruction. You're also going to have likely um, a percentage of your students that are going to need some intervention, either moderate or intensive intervention outside of that core instructional block. And remember, this is time in addition to that core instruction time. I think people make the mistake of pulling kids out of core instruction to give them intervention, um, thinking that they're helping them reach those grade level skills, but we should never keep kids out of this core instruction because if they don't see what in core instruction is, if they're not engaged with it, that's likelihood they're gonna get further and further and further behind. So you wanna know those kids that need some moderate intervention, some intensive intervention, and this will come from your strong quality universal screener. This universal screener is important because it helps us answer some questions. And I alluded to this earlier, and then let's just look a little bit. And I want to orient you to this slide. And then I want you to think uh, a little bit. I'm gonna ask you some questions. So first of all, you'll notice that this is a kindergarten group of students. You'll notice that we've um, administered this universal screener at the beginning of the year. We administered it at the, at the middle of the year, and then we've administered it at the end of the year. And you'll notice those kids in, that are high, that need, you know, that are highly at risk, well below grade level. Um, there's a group of kids that are moderately at risk. And then we have kids that are in green and blue categories that are not showing or indicating any risk levels at this point. So looking at this data, my first question is, oh, and thinking about our RTI triangle, my first question is, is how well is the core instruction working in this kindergarten scenario? And we'll just say this is a, a let's say this is a um, kindergarten, uh, kindergarten classrooms in a single school. Well, you'll notice, and if you said their core instruction is, is doing pretty well, the you would be right. The answer is it's doing pretty well because you notice all of the kids at risk when they came in. And you'll notice that at middle of the year, how many less kids were at risk? And at the end of the year, how many less kids were at risk then? This is really like a, a quality scenario in terms of what you want to see for grade level instruction. And this data can be used to answer a couple questions. How effective is our core instruction? Again, we were able to bring most kids out of risk levels by the end of the year. It's pretty amazing. We also can use this data to say what kids need additional instruction and in what areas. So we could dig into a good universal screener is going to give you um, um, measures that will help you understand those skill areas that kids need to be supported in terms of instruction. But I want you to think about this too at different levels. So if you're a district administrator and you can see this kindergarten instruction for your entire district and you looked at it at the end of the year, you could say, well, you know what? My kindergarten instruction is going pretty well. I don't need to put additional resources into kindergarten at this point. You could do this at a school level. You, you know, you could think about it that way too, but it's all about how you allocate resources and you support those areas that need additional support because of the numbers of students at risk. If you're a building principal, you could look at this kindergarten data and say, you know what? Um, my kindergarten um, ELA program is working pretty well. We get kids out of risk. The next question we want to answer is by the time they come back in first grade, um, how is that working? And so you can then like look at your areas that need support um, and allocation of additional resources. And if you're on a kindergarten team or in a kindergarten classroom, you can use this information to really understand what students need additional instruction. And if your core instruction is actually helping reduce levels of risk. 
So you can see a universal screener can really help and support you as you're thinking about your system and what your system needs. Now I've talked a lot about, about core instruction, right? It's often the missing piece. A lot of times I go into, look at this little triangle down here. I will go into um, districts and talk, talk with folks and they'll say, well, can you help us solve our problem for intervention? Because we have so many kids that need intervention. And the very first place we go is, what's your core instruction look like? You need to have high quality instructional materials delivered in your core. Remember the National Reading Panel told us we need systematic and explicit instruction um, to really help kids develop as proficient readers. And there's a real curriculum effect that happens when you put high quality curriculum into classrooms. Now, I'm not saying that there is a curriculum that's going to reach all students every single time because we know that's not right. But we do know a lot of things about how kids develop as skilled readers and high quality curriculum materials can actually put that in the hands of teachers and it can help them um, so they, they don't have uh, the amount of intervention needs that they might if they didn't have that. We also know we didn't talk about this, but intervention is expensive. And not only is it expensive, but it's much less efficient when kids get into older grades. So the best thing that we can do is we can get kids high quality instruction early in their schooling career, monitor that instruction to ensure that we're intervening very quickly in kindergarten and first grade, and even in second grade so that we don't have um, big intervention issues in the later grades, and we can really target our resources then um, for specific students. So high quality instructional materials are really, really important. All right, so if you follow the podcast at all, um, I'm going to give you a, a couple of, of um, great ideas for listening to episodes. The first one is season five, episode five. And Dr. Brittany Bills joined me. This is a long one, 55 minutes worth. But she joined me to really talk about what it means to implement MTSS. Um, and she was just starting and going through the process. In a new district that she had joined, she talks a little bit about the steps to implementing MTSS because with any change, you can't do it all at once, right? Like you need to take it in, in incremental steps. And so she gives some really good ideas and explanations about how they approached uh, implementing that in their district. And if you've been with us for some of these MTSS webinars before, you know that um, it's, it's fairly comprehensive when we're talking about, let me go back here, when we're talking about doing database decision-making. Well, how do you start with that? If you don't have the right screener, you can't make decisions based on data that you don't have, right? So incrementally, you may need to make some changes or pay attention to some things that need attention um, as you're changing in that process. So listen to Dr. Brittany Bills. Um, it's really an amazing explanation. Um, she's just a powerhouse with lots of great ideas. Um, Remember that this is a framework and we're using student performance data to help us allocate those instructional resources. So we're using the data to help us drive what we do next in that. And the goal of this is to really improve learning for the greatest number of students. So is there some efficiency here? Um, if we can get that quality instruction to students early on, if we can monitor that through our universal screeners, if we can start to have conversations about areas and places that student needs support, we're better off doing that. Um, and it's very efficient to ensure that those kids that are particularly vulnerable to failure um, don't uh, stay out of that uh, need for intervention early on. Again, don't take this to mean that just because we put these quality systems in place, we will never have issues with intervention. We always know that there's going to be students that need more time and instruction. What I'm saying is we want to use our resources most efficiently uh, to get the biggest bang for our buck. Three more podcast recommendations, and they don't always all, I guess I have, I have Dr. Brittany Bills in there, so only two more, sorry. Um, 
They don't always specifically talk about MTSS, but the elements of these podcasts will really help you understand how some of these leaders unpacked and understood the next step that they needed to take. Um, season two, episode one with Dr. Latanya Goffney, who is uh, an instructional leader superintendent in Eldine, Texas. She will talk about walking into an environment and stopping to look at the student data before they made any kind of next steps in terms of their curricular adoption, their program adoption, or anything that they were thinking about changing. Um, and she was really brave and bold in terms her in terms of her, um, you know, uh, focus on how are the students achieving, and uh, is what we're doing now working? And if it's not working, how can we make adjustments? Um, and so I really encourage you to listen to that episode to really um, give yourself some ideas of how to look at the system, whether that's a district level or a school level, or maybe even a grade level, um, to bring that data up and say, how are students doing? And is what we're doing working now? Dr. Jan Hasbrook, I'm sure all of you science of reading enthusiasts know her well. Um, this episode really talked about um, well, she talks about a lot of things, which is really great, but it's all about the right assessment and the right data. And she does a little conversation with me about oral reading fluency. And I think she calls it the silly little measure called oral reading fluency, but how early on they looked at that oral reading fluency measure and found that it told a whole lot about what kids could do in terms of reading proficiency. Um, and how it seemed like a silly little measure to her, but after she saw the data come over and over and over again, um, being validated over and over and over again, um, she learned how powerful that one little assessment was uh, to unlock the students that perhaps were at risk and for sure needed more uh, time and instruction. And then again, I mentioned the Brittany Bills episode, which is really dynamic. Um, so before we get to questions, you can pop some of those questions in. Um, I want to remind everybody of what's coming next. And we have leveraging the science of reading to boost biliteracy. So we're going to start to work into the world of biliteracy. Remember that biliteracy, actually, uh, you can use MTSS in the world of biliteracy as well. Um, we're going to do some work on cross-linguistic transfer, a hot topic. Um, and then really, how do we create a culture of co community and professional learning? Again, when you go back to MTSS and look at what's important about, about implementing F S uh, MTSS, God, I'm having a hard time saying that, um, culture and community at your school um, is really important. I will never forget, um, I should have pulled this slide in, is we also want to remember that one of the biggest effect sizes, so John Hattie's work, he did all that meta-analysis, and one of the biggest effect sizes we can get in terms of learning outcomes is collective efficacy. So if we bring a community or a culture of school or district together and we really believe and implement and follow that data, um, we can have such an impact on what happens in the classroom. All right. Victoria, do we have some questions? We do, Susan. Actually, this is great. One question is about biliteracy from Jay. They're asking, should English learners also receive core instruction or is it okay for English learners, English learning students to be removed for EL or biliteracy services? Oh my gosh, this is such a hard question because yes, no, right? It depends. I think the thing that's really important about English language learners, yes, they should receive core instruction. And this sort of depends on what model you have, right? Um, and I think you're going to learn a lot about that in, in the next session regarding um, biliteracy. But we do want to remember that we can build some scaffolds and supports for L's in the classroom, things that are really easy to do that help them engage in instruction, as well as probably help other kids too. Um, but I think this is going to be one of those both and propositions is that there may be a little bit of time that you have to give them depending on their level. Um, you might have to give them some, you know, short instruction outside the core block, but we want to make sure they're in involved in that time. That's how we develop our language and English language learners are both trying to learn a language while at the same time learning how to read it. 
Um, but we do want them involved in core instruction. And then we have to give them some extra supports and probably um, some extra time outside of that core instruction. Do we have other questions? Yes. So Megan is asking some tips for implementing MTSS with teachers who are unfamiliar and may feel overwhelmed. Oh my gosh. <laughs> That's really good. Well, remember MTSS isn't just a thing that has to happen in the classroom. I think this is the place where um, it is really overwhelming to start this process at first. Um, but good, strong professional development to understand what it is and then taking an incremental approach to it. So I would say that um, the overwhelming nature of it can sometimes come when we are trying to do too many things at once and not understanding one thing at a time. And so for anybody that's trying to either train new teachers that are coming into an MTS, an existing MTSS system, or they're trying to start a new MTSS system, I would think about doing this one step at a time. First, let's understand the purpose of universal screening, and then let's use our strong core instructional program. So I know it's not quite that easy, but I think um, a, a great way to do it is help teachers and uh, and folks remember that there's some discrete elements that has, has to happen with this, universal screening, core instruction for all students, intervention for some students, progress monitoring, and try to use that cycle to help focus, um, to help focus both the development and then at different times of the year. Great. Um, so I actually have a question for you, Susan. Can you explain the difference between MTSS and RTI? Because I know those terms are sort of used interchangeably sometimes, but I know that there is some distinction. So can you explain yep. the difference? Sure. Yeah. I'm going to go back to, let me see if I can go backwards now. So remember MTSS is, is this system of stuff that we're doing. All right. There we go. MTSS is MTSS is all of these things we're putting together. We're taking a look at universal screening. We're going to administer that for those kids that are at risk. We're going to progress monitor them. Um, and then we're going to put kids into this idea of a multi-level prevention system. You see this little circle down here? This multi-level prevention system is really, that's really RTI. And so when we're thinking about RTI, oops, I'm going to move forward in my slides. When we're thinking about RTI, this is the tiered systems of support that sits down in that lower circle. So the tiers are tier one, all students, tier two, some students with additional time, tier three, really intensive intervention. And so that's how they fit together. RTI is really a part of the entire MTSS system. Does that help? Yes, that helps a lot. All I right. think that's it for questions. Wow, all right. Well, I hope this was helpful to everybody. And I really encourage you, if you haven't listened to some of the other webinars, Victoria, can you remind us what the previous webinars were over the, the course of this series? Yeah, that's a great question. So we dove into um, assessments, uh, core instruction, personalized learning, um, and intervention. Two weeks ago, we did a great session on intervention and how the science of reading principles can be integrated into all those different um, tiers of instruction. Um, and then as you can see, we're going to talk about biliteracy. And then also we are going to have Dr. Bills on to talk about uh, building a culture of professional learning and um, transformation. So don't miss that one. That'll be really great. She'll talk all about how her district adopted the science of reading. So it's definitely a session you don't want to miss. Oh, for sure. But listen to that podcast and then, then come listen to the webinar. So essentially our webinar presentations were all about how to get these things in alignment, right? What you do with your assessment data and how that fits into MTSS. How does core instruction fit into MTSS? So if you're interested in each one of those, please go back. And I, sorry, close your eyes. I'm going to give you like motion sickness again, but I just want to remind us of when those dates are. Don't miss this one with uh, Dr. Brittany Bills at the end of November. That's awesome.
Great. Thank you so much. Thanks, Victoria, for your help. Thanks for all for joining.